Hello and a very good morning. Welcome to the second day of the conference on institutions and public policy. For today's session on education as pu public good, uh, our invited chair is Professor Sham Menon. Professor Sham Menon is a distinguished practitioner of institutional development and renewal at higher education. We invite you to the stage, sir. And the invited speaker for today's session is Professor Rohit Dhankar. Professor Dhankar. Uh, uh, is also the founder and secretary of Digantar Jaipur and he's professor in Azim Premji University. He has been part of many initiatives in developing material and curriculum through various committees and collaborative efforts across the country. Rohitji has been part of many NCERT initiatives in developing material and curriculum through various committees. He was an integral part of the National Curriculum Framework 2005 process as a member of National Steering Committee, Drafting Committee, and Chair of Focus Group on Curriculum, Syllabus, and Textbook. We welcome you on the stage, sir. The session is all yours. My sense is that even if, even if the mic doesn't work, it's okay, but it gives a sense of dignity when you hold, <laughs> hold something like this. <laughs> um, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for asking me to be here and uh, uh, facilitate um, Rohit's uh, much-awaited uh, um, presentation. Um, usually, being a chair is like um, a task of uh, catching a cloud and pinning it down. But in the case of uh, Rohit, he is already pinned down by the, by, the <laughs> by the structures of rationality which he is so wedded to. So <laughs> I would certainly count on that. And uh, all I have to do is to, uh, is to be on the ringside and be your cheerleader. Thank you. Good morning, friends. I have taken the chair's permission to present sitting here. Uh, perhaps I'll get tired if I stand there. Uh, also, I'll speak for about 40 minutes. I'll try to cut it short, but uh, those promises I always forget. Um, still. I'll, I'll <laughs> so. <laughs> no. Please, we'll lose out the opportunity of yeah. yeah. So I'm very uh, thankful to Jyotsna for providing me with this opportunity to listen to very thoughtful and rich presentations. I do believe that at the present juncture of our democracy, these discussions are very pertinent. Uh, I also got personally benefited. These days my mind is rather sleepy and these discussions uh, triggered at least two articles of my kind. They are not research articles. Usually I write speculative pieces. So um, I think that is my personal gain in this. Now, for education, um, I have been talking a lot on education, but talking about education as uh, uh, a public good is somewhat odd for me. Uh, I come more from the tradition of education as a necessity for becoming a good human being and uh, rights perspective. But I think this gives me an opportunity to explore interrelationships between two ways of looking at education and its need in the society. Uh, therefore, I welcome it. As a preliminary, I would like to uh, explain that I am taking a particular view of education. And I will discuss mostly intentional education organized through institutional structures or institutional settings. Uh, because I don't want to go into the debate of the larger idea of education in which uh, incidental learning just by living in the society is also education, uh, because that 
uh, you cannot make a public, either it is already a public good and if it is not, the part of it which is not, you can never do. Also, that is not much use in planning education and curriculum and pedagogy, apart from some tangential uses as a background. Therefore, I'll focus on uh, uh, intentional education organized through institutions. <coughs> uh, there are at least three strains to this way of looking at education. One obviously is a system of institutions. The second is processes and practices. And the third is assumement of a desired state of mind in the learner or educatee, the person who is being educated. Uh, one doesn't need to explain much about the first one. We all know all the departments of education, ministries of education, institutions, central and state, etc., form the part of uh, institutional setup, actually, uh, institutional system. Uh, personally, I feel that that is actually uh, a kind of infrastructure for doing uh, what is real education that is uh, necessary, but actually that is not the crux of education. The second is the processes and practices. By that I mean uh, exactly what is going in the classrooms, be that uh, school classrooms or university classrooms, the interaction between the teacher, the student, and the uh, content of education, what is to be learned, achieved, etc. Uh, that is a very important aspect of education, but that is also a way of doing education. And I would say the crux of education is actually the assumement of a desired state of mind. Uh, so basically speaking, overwhelmingly, education is an assumement concept in which we have a certain kind of desired results which we think or we try, strive, that our learners will achieve. I'll focus on this and uh, in, in the further discussion. Now, uh, coming to public good, uh, one, by the way, I'm taking public good as a kind of tentative understanding uh, I'm new to this area and uh, uh, just ne good enough uh, which the philosophers of education use in their analysis. This may not be a kind of perfect analysis in terms of the economist's understanding. So this is coming more from that side. Uh, one definition seems to be mm, a good which is non-rivalrous and non-excludable uh, is a public good or could be uh, a, a good which is non-rivalrous, I'll explain that, and non-excludable uh, can be termed as a public good. Uh, I'll explain this, but at the same time I'll add a good which is non, no, first let me explain, non-rivalrous means by uti utilizing or using that good by me, it does not affect your capability or um, your possibility of using that good. So. Uh, this is non-rivalrous in this manner. Uh, Non-excludable means that you cannot draw a fence around it to exclude anyone, say air. So mm, uh, I'm breathing in this room, okay, I'm a smoker and it may have some impact on your health, but generally speaking, this doesn't bother even some much. Uh, and uh, uh, by my breathing, it's actually uh, air which is available to him is still available. At the same time, you cannot draw a fence around me to stop me from breathing air. So therefore, air in this sense is a public good. So uh, that's what uh, basically this, this uh, definition means. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but that's, uh, but I would add that only those goods of this nature which contributes something positive to the general well-being of the society could be called uh, could be called public goods. Uh, I'm bringing an ethical point here, and I'm not certain how economists would respond to that. But something which is available to everyone cannot be drawn fence around, and something which is very bad for the public or well-being of the society, I would uh, be very very hesitant to call it a uh, public good. So, now, if we pursue this example a little bit further, 
uh, and we take the availability of air, uh, say in Delhi, particularly during the winter. And availability of air in my remote village in Rajasthan, and availability of air in, uh, say, Nainital, uh, up in the mountains. And all these are Indian citizens, but the quality of air available to them, in spite of air being a public good, is uneven. Uh, I do not know whether any state or anything can do at this level. We will come to some other examples in which something could be done. So, uh, it seems that uh, uh, here, the public good is, the, the air is a public good, but the availability of quality is uneven. Now imagine some rich people in, in Delhi who buy a gadget which is called uh, air purifier and keep in their room. So actually now they have carved out a little private good out of this public good. And that is not public good because that gadget cannot be bought by everyone. So uh, it has restrictions on, on, on on people, though it's, it may not be, uh, though it still may be non-rivalrous, but uh, this now becomes excludable. Ex uh, sorry, um, excludable. So that is one definition. Uh, there is another definition which I like better, and uh, very quickly I'll share that also um, with you before um, we go any further. That changes the words a little bit. It says a public good is one that satisfies the basic availability condition and the open access to, mm, the, and the open access condition. So two conditions. Basic availability condition, which is very akin uh, to non-rivals in the sense that whatever quantity of something is needed or considered to be uh, basic necessity is available to everyone without hindering availability to anyone else. And the second uh, says that one, uh, uh, it doesn't depend on the capability to pay. So this is actually has open access uh, to everyone who mm, require and attempt to uh, acquire it. Uh, I would use this definition because the phrasing seems to be a little bit more amenable to educational discourse mm, in this. Before going to uh, mm, uh, education, I would also consider, uh, by the way, uh, now, um, most of the economic uh, analysis I saw around it uh, in, in about who would pay, uh, etc., uh, it seems that one cannot make a very tight logic that there could be certain goods which could be, uh, which necessarily have to be on the economic grounds, purely on the cost uh, benefit, etc., grounds. Also, people have doubts about the ethical grounds uh, and they, they, they cast doubts that this may not, be, um, may not be even ethical for the government to coerce some people to pay uh, for availability of public goods to everyone else. There are several problems. I'm not going into details of that because of the lack of time, uh, but this is the problem of free riders and several other contradictions, etc. I will leave, I'm, I'm leaving that out. But I would go a little bit further or with our example because that would be useful to me a little later um, in, in the educational um, discourse. Now, if we take an example of availability of water, at one time in the villages of Rajasthan, you can say uh, the water was a public good through basically through two means. One is public wells. Uh, which uh, somehow were dug by the community uh, or sometimes aided by the state, but mostly organized by the community and uh, rainwater collected. So through these two mechanisms, it was a public good. Now, when the irrigation started and electrification and tube wells, etc., came, uh, the water table receded to something about 1,000 uh, feet. And the water which was available to everyone in there, they could, if they could manage to dig a well in their field, was available to them. It is not available now, and cost has increased much more. Also, 
in certain areas, no water at all. You don't hit a water table at all. So it has now become, in that sense, a private good. And the people who have water in their fields actually fill tankers and sell it. So something which was already a public good has become a uh, private good because of the um, environmental changes mostly brought out by human activity. Now, let's go to the next step. Now, the state government uh, tries to fill tankers and send to every village maybe twice or thrice a week so that every villager can store water at least for drinking and cooking purposes enough every week. Now, they are trying to meet this basic availability condition and this is free, therefore open access. So water going from public goods to private good and now through the government and administrative efforts again trying to become a, a, a public good. So this cycle can happen uh, in anything. Why did I spend time on this? Because I want to state a few assumptions which I believe that given time I could argue very rigorously but here I only state them. Why does the government try to uh, make this water, uh, uh, mm, drinking water, a public good. Uh, let's imagine a smaller society, not uh, because imagining India, which is about one fifth of the humanity, is very, very difficult. Let's imagine a smaller society, and I will uh, state some assumptions, which later on you can you can question. I would say that societies are groups of people who definitely who define themselves as its members. Uh, the membership is based on shared values, experiences, traditions, aspirations, and visions of good human life. Now, societies become, within quote, self-conscious in a way. They are not creatures who, are, who can become self-conscious, but societies develop their own kind of images through the members uh, in them, uh, so to speak and want to perpetuate their existence. This I believe most of the social scientists would agree that the social formations uh, have a tendency to perpetuate their existence. But their existence depends on the members. And thus, at least an optimum number of members uh, is necessary for a society to, uh, to exist. Now, drinking water is essential for the lives of the members, and therefore, it seems that societies might have an interest in making drinking water uh, a public good. Uh, we, will, we will use this example. I'll add one more assumption, that unhygienic, drink, uh, un unhygienic drinking water actually will take a toll on the um, uh, people's health, and therefore, uh, contribution to the well-being of society and contribution to the prosperity of the society uh, through its members as well as the stability of the society will be in danger. Therefore, maybe society is interested also in providing hygienic drinking water. We will keep this, this, these ideas and these assumptions in my mind, in our mind, and now we will go to education. Okay. So, Education as a public good. First, let's begin a little bit more looking at education. What, 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 what is the notion of education I have in mind? And for that, I'll take help from a very well-known philosopher of education, uh, Israel Scheffler. Uh, and we will explore the relationship between region, freedom, human dignity, and education through this little mm, passage. Scheffler writes that region stands always in contrast with inconsistency and expediency, which means that region is something which maintains consistency and uh, does, not, does not waver um, uh, uh, with, uh, with various kinds of expediencies. He says, in the judgment of particular issue, that's what region does in the judgment. In the cognitive realm, Reason is a kind of justice to the evidence, a fair treatment of merits of the case in the interest of truth. So the ideal for reason in the cognitive realm is truth and uh, fair treatment uh, of all the available um, evidence. In the moral realm, 
Reason is action on principle. So there have to be some principles. Action which therefore does not bend with the wind, nor lean to the side of advantage or in the side of the power out of weakness or in the self-interest. So there have to be some grounds on which uh, the judgment is arrived and those grounds are uh, ideally unaffected by my personal interest, by fear of the authority or by um, these kinds of considerations. Whether in the cognitive or moral realm, reason is always a matter of treating equal reasons equally. Therefore, in, in uh, Seffler's definition of reason, equality is built uh, already into it. Actually, he is drawing on Kant, uh, where equality is a necessary part of human reason. And uh, judging the issues in the light of the general principles in which, uh, to which one has bound oneself. Now this last point is important, particularly we will come to education, but this is important and Schaeffler repeats it. In thus binding myself to a set of principles, I act freely. Sounds contradictory, but I bind myself with a set of principles which are unwavering, stick to it, that is my freedom and that is my dignity as a human being. Uh, as I said, definition is taken from Kant. But compare it with we Indians, uh, in, in, when we became free, we said we give ourselves this constitution. What are we doing? Actually, we are binding ourselves with a set of principles. Each one of us has to do this act of giving a constitution or to ourselves at a minuscule scale our own moral code. That's then only according to Seffler and some other philosophers of education, you become free and then only you acquire the true meaning of human dignity. Now, I would add that be it in the case of the person or an institution, this is what autonomy means. Autonomy is, is not uh, any which action, autonomy is always uh, a judgment arrived at on the basis of some principles. Now, Schaeffler goes on mm, that rationality, and this is again important, rationality is an essential aspect of human dig dignity. And the rational goal of humanity is to construct a society in which such dignity can flower. A, so a society of uh, a society of order, so, sorry, a society so ordered as to adjudicate, um, adjudicate rationally the affairs of free rational agents. So rational judgment as well as each agent is free. An international and democratic republic. And the last line, the job of education is to develop character in the broadest sense, that is, principles, thought and action in which dignity of man is manifest. This is the state of mind which, it's, which I mentioned in the beginning, we should strive to, uh, to, to achieve for our learners and for the educatee. That's why I, I, I quoted uh, this passage. Is Seffler alone? in thinking this manner? No. Uh, first, as I already reminded you, this is our condition, you know, achievement condition of education. This is what crux of the education is. Now, why such an education should be a public good? It's okay. One can have an idealistic definition of education, but why, 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 why it is required to be a public good? Well, I do not know how strong this argument is, but it came to my mind that at the level of humanity, there seems to be already a reasonably sound argument. If we borrow from Kant and go by his categorical imperative, uh, one particular formulation, which he calls humanitarian formulation, that goes, so act that, uh, so act that uh, you use humanity uh, whether in your person or someone else, always as, 
as an end in itself and never only as a means to your ends. We simply put means, don't use humans for your own purposes. Don't use even yourself for your own emotional purposes. From this Kant derives through a simple argument, I don't have time to go into that, but he derives from this, that this is our duty as human beings to develop our own talents, otherwise we are actually wasting our humanity and we are not respecting the dignity of human being. Which means that each one of us is duty bound to develop our own talents. Try to remember the directive principle that we as Indians have a duty to develop uh, um, uh, scientific temper. Uh, this, this comes very close. Kant one is broader and more firmly rooted into the philosophical argumentation. But how can we develop our talents? Unless until education is available to us, the opportunity to develop our talents and our capabilities are freely, unhindered, available to us, we cannot do that. Therefore, right from the idea of being human, it seems that education of a certain kind should be available to everyone through some mechanism or other. Uh, obviously, today I am not going to talk about mechanism at all. Now, Let's go to the final stage where we can talk about the society, democracy, and education together. That was broader at the humanitarian level. So, we all as humans develop a self-image. Uh, that is part of being self-conscious, no, or, or part of being human. All societies are composed of these self-conscious rational beings. And these beings together with themselves also develop a vision of a desirable society. It seems to me that the most popular vision of a desirable society world over today is a democratic society. So when we talk of preserving a society, we are not talking of preserving any which kind of mm, barbaric society. We actually are making it more or less a precondition of a certain society in, it, in which equality, freedom, justice, uh, dignity of human beings are. Uh, so that is the kind of society that have become fused with the very definition of society, it seems to me. As far as India is concerned, I do believe that we are uh, mm, mm, heatedly debating uh, this very point at this moment. Now, what are the conditions, what are the kinds of people who can sustain a democratic society? We will, I'll, I'll mm, talk about three or four different things which point to the same thing. Uh, one basic assumption about the democratic um, people in the democratic society is stated in very simple terms by Patricia White and I like this formulation particularly. She says that we are imagining that these choice making human beings in the society are moderately, moderately rational. She is not saying they are absolutely rational. They are moderately, uh, moderately rational. Moderately benevolent. They are not the people who do not like other people and want to harm them. But they don't go out of their way and may not actually harm themselves to benefit others. I do not know about that. That might be a moral idea. That may not be a necessity for a democratic society. But uh, moderate benevolence seems to be a necessity for a democratic society. And they have a moderate strength of will which means that whatever judgment they arrive at, this would require effort and they are ready to take the pains to make it realize in the real life, as well as they have the self-restraint to be guided by their moderate, moderate rationality. So these are the three conditions, she says, that uh, people uh, in democratic society we are assuming because uh, in democratic society, we all have to make certain kinds of judgments for favoring or critiquing or um, opposing certain kinds of decisions of the powers that be. 
and therefore for a rational discourse and participating in the democratic process they seem to be necessary. There is nothing new in this. Actually, mm, Mudahliar Commission, in the very beginning of our democratic uh, journey, uh, wrote, and I quote, citizenship in a democracy is very exacting and challenging responsibility for which every citizen had to be carefully trained. It involves many intellectual, social, and moral qualities which cannot be expected to grow uh, of their own accord. Now, intellectual capability, rationality, moral, benevolence, social, etc., regulating my own behavior, etc. Uh, not exactly the same terms, but it seems that one can talk about uh, when detailing, uh, there one, one is likely to find a large overlap. Now coming back Scheffler to again, and you will be surprised how, uh, how uh, Scheffler echoes, I'm not saying deliberately he had read uh, Mudaliar because Mudaliar commission was earlier, but how, um, how rational minds think alike as a joke. Anyway, uh, a society committed to the democratic ideal is one that makes uh, peculiarly difficult and challenging demands on its members. That's precisely what Mudaliar is saying. Uh, it accordingly also makes stringent demands on those processes through which its members are educated. So therefore there has to be some kind of program, program, carefully thought out program to develop that. And if we want to give the final yeah, yeah, I'll stop in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Now, maybe we can give the last word to an Indian on this issue and then come back to Mudaliar Commission. And this is particularly important, what I'm going to quote just now at this juncture of our society. This is prophetic to me. I do not know. You can make your own judgment. I quote, a democracy of people who can think only confusedly and can neither make can neither make progress nor even maintain itself because it will always be open to the risk of being misled and exploited by demagogues who have within their reach today unprecedented powerful unprecedentedly powerful media of mass communication compare the mudaliar commission in 52 1952, compare the power of the mass media in 1952 and today. And Mudaliar Commission is worried that if we do not know how to think carefully, then demagogues will hijack our minds and make us think what they like. Now, uh, through mass communication and propaganda, to be effective, a democratic citizen should have the understanding of the in understanding and the intellectual integrity to shift truth from falsehood, facts from propaganda, and to reject the dangerous appeal of fanaticism and prejudice. Sounds absolutely prophetic to me. I think that we were warned that this might happen to us and this is happening to us now. So, coming back, they all hint towards that very, very softly articulated moderate rationality, moderate benevolence, and moderate strength of will to guide or, or, or you know, self-control, guide my own conduct. Now, the thing is, that is what a person is assumed to be in democracy. A democratic society cannot exist unless a good majority of members fulfill these conditions. And these qualities are not inborn in humans. The only avenue for humans is to develop these qualities through education. Therefore, it seems to me that the basic availability and open access of opportunity to develop these qualities is absolutely necessary for the very existence of the society as a democratic society. And therefore, it should be a public good 
uh, in these, these very terms. It seems to me that our biggest problem today is that we are falling below the critical line in this moderate rationality, benevolence, and self-restraint. And uh, what could be done, I do not know. I'm, I'm more of a thinking about education and doing small things in one school. Systemic changes, etc., is uh, uh, Vargis, uh, um, Sham, Jyotsna, and uh, these people's um, avenue. Uh, may I conclude with, a, um, with the last uh, three mantras of Rig Veda. You might be very surprised that I am jumping back to 3,000 years after this discourse on Mudaliar and, and Shefla. But please listen to this. Uh, and also listen to my interpretation then later on. Uh, these last three lines, the three, three mantras uh, in Rig Veda say, come together, speak together, together let your thoughts agree, just as the gods of long ago, coming to an agreement together, reverently approach their uh, sacrificial portion. Common to them all is the solemn utterance, common the assembly, common their thoughts along with their perceptions. I hereby utter an utterance common to you all on your behalf with an oblation common to you all I offer on your behalf. And the last line, common in your purpose, common your hearts, let your thoughts be common so that it will go well for you all together. Now, replace the gods and oblations, etc., with whatever we have in society and for ourselves and produce through our cooperation. And rather than making it a prayer, let us achieve this common goal through open, rational deliberation. The idea of the society moving and having an agreement among all its people is old. Maybe they were thinking uh, through different means. Today we have the rational apparatus with us to strive for this. Personally, I feel, friends, that what we need in the majority of Indian citizens today is a large good heart guided strictly by a rational mind and um, unwavering commitment to truth. And that we cannot achieve unless we make education freely available to every citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for sticking strictly to your time limit <laughs> that you yourself had set. And uh, uh, I always used to feel that, um, you know, listening to uh, philosophers, particularly analytical school, uh, it's like um, listening to a, um, a presentation, uh, uh, listening to a geometric, <laughs> you know, pro uh, the, uh, formulation. You know, it, it has a certain architecture in that argument, uh, in the sense, series of arguments uh, based on postulates and uh, implications and then uh, riders and so on. Um, so it was such a pleasure listening to you. Um, without much ado, and I would like to um, uh, throw this open to, uh, um, uh, but uh, to begin with, maybe since he invoked you as a systemic person, uh, Varghese, uh, we can't let him down. <laughs> he deals with one school and you have to deal with the system. Yeah. And also, uh, Professor Dinkar, it was nice listening to you. I'll take a very... Yeah, I think now it's yeah. huh? okay. I'll take a very traditional view. Before important things that he mentioned. See, there are two issues, if you look at from an economics perspective or a social scientist perspective on education, how much we should spend on education or invest on education, and how should we share the cost of education. 
these are the two issues. When we consider whether education is a public good or a private good, etc., essentially, these are the two issues. And more importantly, it is not education which is a public good. In 1954-56, when this public good was defined, it was knowledge was considered as a public good, not education. Even when knowledge is a public good, knowledge producing institutions need not be public goods. That is the difference between schools, universities, colleges, and uh, the knowledge that is being produced. So for example, you produce a research evidence. That evidence that you produce, the research result is a public good. But on the other hand, a university or a department or an institution is producing the knowledge good. They invest a lot of money. Need not be the public. It can be the private. So there is a difference between knowledge which is a public good and the process of knowledge production which, is, which involves institutions. And institutions may not be a private, uh, public good, you know. So that is why, as uh, Rohit started with by saying that non-excludability and non-rivalrous, these are two characteristics are defined uh, by the Nobel laureate in 1957-58. Uh, not that when he got, at that time he got Nobel Prize, because Nobel Prizes in economics were introduced only in 1969. So w that is something very different that is to be noted. That's one point. What does it mean? It means that the accepted theory and definition of spending on education, who should spend on education is that at the lower levels of economic development, the state should spend on education. And at higher levels of education, it may be the state and the households. This is generally the norm that is accepted. And you find that this is the trend that you find in most cases. The only exception that is brought by the distortion, is as a distortion by the marketer, is that in the developed countries, even today, nearly 80% of the educational expenditure is borne by the state. I'm talking about whole educational expenditure, not higher education, school education. In the OECD, what we call as the OECD countries. Whereas in the developing and less developed countries, you find that market is more prominent. I have a hypothesis, which I have developed uh, much earlier. It states that in the matured market economies and in the less matured market economies, what is the trend that you find? Higher education is massified or universalized in the matured market economies through public institutions. Whereas in the less developed market economies and less matured market economies, Higher education is massified and uni universalized through the private institutions. If you see India, the empirical evidence, when public sector was dominant in the first 50 years of planned development, we had only an enrollment ratio of 8.3 and a total enrollment of 8.4 million. But in the next, when the private sector entered in a big way with markets, mm -hmm. within, 20, within 18 years or 17 years, what you find is that the enrollment increased from eight Four and four million to forty million, and you also find that it is no GR also increased from eight point uh, three to around twenty-seven to twenty-eight percent. It's a fast increase that is taking place. What is happening is that what we considered as a public good has become a private good, and depending upon the availability of resources within the household, people try to make it as a private good and try to maximize their investment in that. That means the priority changed, investment changed, and the returns to education changed, which acted as an important dimension. So for example, in the public sector, when you talk about how much we should spend, this is based on three criteria. What is considered to be social demand criteria, and what is considered to be cost-benefit analysis, and also what is considered to be manpower analysis. Sorry for using the word manpower. Now if I use manpower, women, our women colleagues will be uh, shouting. But that is a technical terminology that is used. So nowadays it is shifted to human resource approach to development. These are the three ways, but I don't want to get into the details. But essentially what is happening today is that public sector investment, 1968 policy, we said that we should spend 6%. 86 policy repeated that. 2020 policy also repeated that. 
But what has happened is that no change that has taken place. It was 3%, it has become 4% or 3.8% depending upon the data source that you are using. We have not reached that, public sector. Even if we reach 6%, I don't think that the education financing of problems in education will be resolved. It is much beyond that, you know. So my point is that essentially we have tried to, over a period of development, the income levels and middle class in India have gone up. And as a result of that, we shifted the burden of pursuing education to the non governmental sector. This has a lot of implications for quality of education that is provided, which uh, is touched upon in a different context, and also the employment opportunities which are provided. That is how inequalities are getting perpetuated. And I will stop by saying that the situation today is that even if we want to consider education as a public good, it is a public good without public support. Thank you. Thank you, Burgess. Um, open the floor now. Jokes now, would you like to come? Come immediately, since others are hesitant, maybe they want, they want to follow you. Um, that was uh, fascinating and enlightening. Um, I don't think I'd agree with, uh, disagree with anything you said. I think it was uh, uh, very much uh, to the point. But there is this uh, uh, ghost of the specter of uh, this ogre of Indian, current Indian society lurking in the background. And so that prompts my, my, my question, not question, but request to you to, for a reflection. Um, the state that you're describing as being desirable is based on all those moderates, the three moderates. But if your starting point or the evolution that we've had in the past has reached, taken us to a point, which is now the starting point, let's say, is of such extreme differences that moderation of any kind is not around. And if there is moderation, it is within groups which between themselves are not moderate. Uh, now this applies partly to the question, the process of thought, what is the nature of society? Are there one society or two or more? It also applies to what you said about the inequalities, but uh, the behind this is basically the market-driven principle is one of fundamental inequalities. And that's not compatible with any form of a public good with regard to education in any way. So the responsibility comes back. If we have those forms of inequality and they cannot, people can't service that need themselves, then what's the nature of society? Where does the obligation of society, which means the people who are not excluded, but the people who are included, what becomes their social obligation if they are still members of the same society to, f to actually fund and finance uh, a universal process. So that's, I want a reflection from you on how do we uh, start moving towards that moderation. Uh, it sounds very Gandhian in a way, and uh, perhaps that's the kind of a thing which is, I mean, it, int introspection is required and, and behavioral change at the individual level and so on, all that is, I can accept that, but what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how do we move in that direction? I mean, we've lost the opportunity of teaching children the constitution and schools uh, 50 years ago and in some way learning those values through the written word, um, where are we now? So a reflection please, it's not a question, I'm sorry. I just want to um, reiterate that uh, that was a brilliant talk and um, to ask the question in terms of the rise of demagogues, right? That is one of the conclusions. Uh, and the warning against it. Uh, one of the key things we assume is that in schools or in the process of education, something like freedom of speech as a value is taught and is seen as something to be protected. This is taught, for example, very heavily in American schools. Yeah? And any time there is any infringement on that, the everyone is up in arms. At the same time, you do have the emergence of a demagogue like Trump, right? So 
despite the fact that you have very different uh, values that are being taught in schools like in India versus in America, you still have the same risk emerging. So the question is why? Then what would be the role of values in uh, schooling systems, right? To protect democracy. One more question and then you can, yeah, yeah, please. Yes, ah, then two more. Thank you, Rohit, that was, uh, I enjoyed every minute and I also liked the counter that we got from that end. I think that there's a certain silence that we have uh, in our system. For example, you talked about the, the benevolent, moderate, self-restraining human. Uh, as the as what we want to achieve through the process of education and if I look at those measures then most of us are not educated even those who are most highly qualified right certified who've gone to the best educational so-called institutions have not learned this uh, I'm not talking only about those who haven't gone to school I'm talking about those who have gone to the best institutions as well who might not even know how to talk to a female colleague I think the silence is about we not talking about the bad stuff, talking about caste, talking about religion, talking about gender, talking about our constitution, talking about the fact that we are not really democratic in our homes, in our ways of being with each other. And the silence that we seem to want to maintain is to me a very disturbing part. It's not just about who will pay for education, et cetera. But we need something that really counters this hegemonic silence. And that doesn't necessarily have to come from the school. But it really has to come from another space. And school has to endorse it and protect it and amplify it. But we seem to have lost that of what are we actually trying to create as a society. And I think the last question really throws you in a, in a when you've seen communities where schools are creating critical thinkers, argumentative children, so to speak, and we still have the rise of the Trumps in those situations. So that makes it even much more complex here that we have the masses of people who are not taught critical thinking, who are not trained to be this benevolent human dignity embodiments. Um, we then we seem to think that small organizations like yours, mine, who are doing this, you know, alternatives and creating these alternative experiments, working with a few people, trying to create this wonderfully articulate, critical thinking, young people and young children. We can't have the answers to this. I think there's a lot of expectation that um, some small civil society independent organizations will get some money, some people from somewhere and do some magic. It, ca it can't happen. We need something much more fundamental. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your uh, remarks as well. I was actually thinking uh, the public good argument, uh, one reason why we are trying to look at it is uh, because who has to finance uh, education. That That is one of the major reasons why we uh, examine whether education must be public good or not. Um, the way the discourse has been built, um, we still haven't made any uh, major breakthroughs in the way uh, it has worked. So I was probably thinking of uh, other ways of articulations of uh, education as a public good. And uh, interestingly, uh, when we go back to uh, Dr. Ambedkar and all, there is some sort of an articulation where he puts uh, the, um, ex the, ex ex the expenditure on education must at least be equivalent to the um, income that the state receives through the uh, excise excess departments in the sense uh, the morality question he puts in between where uh, education the spending on education must always be much greater than uh, um, what uh, the state being from uh, promoting in one sense uh, uh, immoral uh, space so I think if we can challenge our own selves uh, with the ideas of um, how we articulate education as a public good through uh, other thinkings as well. Maybe we'll be able to reach out to a lot of people and convince um, 
the general public towards the need of it that was one and uh, one aspect that i was thinking for that came up in the uh, discussions in the questionnaire session was um, um, uh, critical thinking and uh, rise of demagogues um, dr manish jain was uh, speaking yesterday elsewhere um, he was making a distinction between critical thinking and critical pedagogy where critical thinking gives us various perspectives and approach to uh, all uh, question already existing narratives but uh, is it rooted in social justice is what uh, makes uh, critical thinking and critical pedagogy different is what dr manish jain was arguing so i think if we think on uh, these lines maybe we have some uh, cues we could work forward with i was not counting on countering workies but <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm saying I would like to counter. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So I was not counting on countering. Uh, that's all. But anyway, leave that out. Yes, I agree with most of the economic part of the argument. But it seems to me that there are certain things in the society which perhaps uh, we have to think, take into consideration other, other, other aspects as well, and the. ideals and values and continuation of certain uh, uh, traditions and achieving certain aspirations in the society they themselves it seems that push the society in a certain direction and what mechanism could be there one has to think about it but at the same time i'd also say that the way i was talking of education was neither about uh, knowledge being public good or the mm, the mm, institution as being public good i was saying this opportunity for every single individual to develop their rationality benevolence and self restraint and will or in sefler's terms uh, independence of thought guided by reason and human and and and, and towards human dignity developing the opportunity to develop these capabilities should be freely available to every citizen so here we are this is what education is this is what the crux of education is so when we say making education a public good the issue is not admission into delhi university as a public good but at least a certain level which the democratic society agrees at this moment we have agreed to the elementary education therefore for elementary education this opportunity is unhinderedly available to every single citizen uh, would be citizen every single child that's what i meant so therefore this is not an issue of either knowledge being public good or the institutions being public good the opportunity to get one's educated that's what uh, i was talking about acceptable policy acceptable oh yes you see the the quality is built into moderate rationality and and all that so yes that's absolutely i mean that was the the argument i was uh, trying to this uh, i think that the, uh, definitely the enrollment and school going children have phenomenally uh, increased and now even in the poor rural villages actually more children go to the private schools than to the uh, to the government schools that is true but uh, Uh, why has that happened it's a very very complex question i am a villager i go to my village every month at least two three days the main thing is pressure on the land they do not know what their children will do if they don't get educated that's one of the earlier in my generation uh, this pressure was not there i can become a farmer now that opportunity is no more there so there are i'm just pointing out one thing there are several other reasons of this nature not the indian economic policies alone uh, reasons are somewhere else it seems to me now coming to the um, extreme difference and uh, you see uh, i agree with you that first of all i do not think that uh, our education has uh, uh, served democracy very well whatever could be the reasons uh 
maybe we didn't have enough resources, maybe our planning was not great, uh, maybe our understanding of educational education and educational processes and how values and capabilities develop in human beings, uh, there could be thousand and one reasons. Uh, in the, today, I couldn't go into that, but it seems to me that our education didn't serve the democracy too well. The other thing is that since our education did not serve, therefore education does not serve. That I would find a little bit of, of problematic unless something else is suggested that this will serve. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem. We have to do that. I do agree that the kind of hint that was in your question, that uh, education is a responsibility of the society. I consider actually state as an organ of the society uh, fashioned for fulfilling certain roles. I don't think, uh, it never comes in my mind, state as the master of the society or an oppressor. It always comes as a tool fashioned by the or not exactly a tool, a vavastha, fashioned by the society to do certain purposes. And I think uh, it could be funded through the, mm, the state. But also let's try to remember that we had a very, very robust tradition, particularly in Sekhawati in, and other areas of Rajasthan, where, uh, where uh, these people, industrialists, opened free schools in their villages in hundreds. So the well-to-do citizens uh, of the society can contribute uh, to, to good education. Uh, I also believe that even economists, they make this argument that public good actually can also be provided through private means. Even, even they agree on that. Therefore, I do believe that the, the people who are in a fortunate situation of helping the society, if they understand the argument. Now, why it is beneficial to everyone? Uh, we don't have time and Sham will stop me, so I'll give one or two simple examples. I do believe that you would like to have a neighbor as someone who is moderately rational, moderately self-restrained, and benevolent people rather than a rude, arrogant people as your neighbor. So try to think of all our neighbors throughout the, mm, the, the country. I do believe that having a certain qualities in people, uh, certain desirable qualities in people, benefit the society in terms of its contribution as well as its organization, as well as its governance and everything else. Uh, so from that point of view. Now this is very interesting that Trump as a demagogue uh, you see, I'm not very well versed in American politics. And uh, I'm also extremely skeptical about, uh, in theoretically, these terms are fine. But who is a demagogue and who is uh, not, to me, requires a lot more information systematically analyzed. I, I'm, I have, I'm not saying Trump is not a demagogue. All I'm saying is, which one is a bigger one between Trump and Biden? Uh, at this moment, I don't have enough information to pronounce on that. So, but coming back more seriously to it, uh, that simply means that education alone cannot do everything. Education can contribute. That's the big mistake we actually often do, that we think that if something could be sold through education, then alone, education alone will do everything. No. Education contributes like several other things in the society. Also, I do not know whether freedom of speech, etc., in American schools uh, are actually taken rationally seriously. Because I have read in last two years at least five or six articles when certain professors in their classroom challenged certain fashionable theories, including uh, uh, this flexibility of uh, biological sex, uh, and they were terminated. Where is the freedom of speech in, in that kind of mahol? This is more like freedom to speak according to the fashion. And universities are the biggest places uh, for this, including our own. So I'm not sure about, about that. Role of schools in developing these qualities, and I do not know whether I can say anything more about it. Uh, 
about uh, we need something much bigger than just these either small attempts or uh, you know uh, partly i uh, i already uh, said that uh, education alone cannot fix everything so several other things would be required but personally if you ask me since i am a teacher and that's perhaps the only thing i know so uh, therefore i am serving my own purpose actually but it seems to me that uh, mm, uh, education can contribute if we think a little bit more carefully about the school setting, uh, curriculum, uh, pedag pedagogy, and the training of teachers can reasonably contribute. Alone cannot solve the problem, but can reasonably contribute. I do have small examples of small schools where children actually uh, question the norms in, the, uh, in their small areas in the family or in the village and change certain small things. So uh, let's not think of changing the Indian democracy suddenly in half an hour, but millions of children changing uh, within the family smaller things and uh, cumulative effect of that. And it seems that up to a certain extent, uh, this seems to be mm, possible. Yes, I am making an argument of the state should be responsible. How it arranges is, is a different issue. Uh, critical thinking and critical pedagogy, uh, I am not very very comfortable with the, with the comparison. One is a process uh, and another is an achievement and uh, there are category problems in comparing these two. I was also not talking of critical thinking. I was talking of development of rationality, development of reason, which is a much bigger thing than this tiny critical thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. I, I, I'm aware that there are uh, questions still, as you said, lurking <laughs> in the bag, but that's OK. At least it's a yes, surely. And it, it, uh, it, it certainly flagged some important uh, um, uh, you know, questions and issues. Um, uh, restricting to school, just school education, one of the uh, major problems that we are facing is actually increasing homogeneity within classes and uh, um, and uh, uh, you know instead of diversity being contained in a single institution single class now we are diversity in terms of the kind of institutions that each segments will go which means that relative homogeneity within classroom and general diversity uh, contained by diverse kind of institutions in such a setting after all uh, moderation and tolerance and everything is best uh, practiced when there is diversity around. When there is no diversity around, then I think it's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, morality being uh, practiced within the uh, uh, cloisters of a convent. Yeah. Thank you, sir. That was a really enriching session. Uh, so I request everyone to proceed for a short tea break. Uh, we will assemble again here around 11.55. Thank you. <laughs>